We tend to think of, e- of ecology and nature as something that's out there. And we have our own social systems. And a lot of what we've been talking about here today even has been about our social systems and how we need to change and stuff like that. But social ecological systems are linking the two together because they are linked, in fact. Everything in this universe is linked. What I'm going to propose here is that sustainable design in its current uh, form is essentially trying to work within the existing system. And that is what I'm calling the immovable eventuality there. Um, And that immovable eventuality is the end of oil, population decline, and climate change. Um, What I hope to present is a social ecological systems approach, which is a different paradigm. The way I would describe sustainable design in the system at the moment is essentially imagine the designer or the creative person, the economist, uh, whoever you want, who, uh, who is out there creating things. And you're, you're sitting up in a tree, but you're actually sawing the very branch off that you're sitting on. And you're looking down and, oh, God, it doesn't look good down there, you know. And that's the eventual uh, immovable eventuality, you know. That's the end of oil is down there, population decline, everything. And it all feels really, really bad, but we, we continue to saw. We continue to sit on that branch and saw. And meanwhile, what we're trying to do is we're saying, well, maybe if we made the saw with using recycled plastic for the handle, and maybe if we made the teeth a little bit sharper and we really focused on the rhythm of our sawing, it would all be fine. But I think that really what we have to do is we have to move away from that that's taken us to the point at which our entire life systems are put at risk. So here we find ourselves in the present. What are the repercussions of this virtual reality that we've created for ourselves? It was soon after that, in the 1800s, we began to use oil. And you can see the correlation between the consumption of oil and how the population has gone up. So why is this? Well, it's simple. We started industrial farming, basically. We, we, we introduced the uh, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphate fertilizer, and that together with farm equipment, we could produce more food. And this, this curve looks absolutely normal um, to anybody who's looked at, at, at population growth. And the reason it looks normal is if you supply food, the population grows. If, if people are feeling happy and healthy and, and there's food around, the population will grow. So this, this we're just like rabbits, you know, or any other cities. species on this planet. So do you think that the cost and delivery of food to these cities might be affected when, when oil runs out? We all know that oil is running out, and many of us believe that we can just replace it with some other form of energy. But I think that's an illusion, because we'd just be shifting the problem to somewhere else, and something else is going to run out. The planet is finite. George Monbiot advises that there's a very, very obvious solution, which is to keep the, just leave the oil in the ground. You know, it's like, wow. I mean, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? I mean, we've got this massive problem, and the one thing that we're not doing is just not doing it. Just leave the oil in the ground. Well, the problem stems, in the UK at least, because last year, the UK government made 12.9 billion pounds in t- corporate tax from the oil companies that it leases its land to, our land to, as we sucked up 2.5 million barrels of oil a day. So it's really a supply and demand. The government is just doing what we've asked them to do. So the, the We've all been so caught up in this big party of oil that we've forgotten to look outside. And now the party's over. It's almost morning. Everyone's going to have a really bad hangover. But we need to get out and get some fresh air. Ecology is the study of relationships among organisms and the environments in which they live, including living and non-living components. Professor Arne Ness, a very famous Norwegian philosopher, um, he coined the word ecosophy, which is um, essentially a, a philosophy of the ecological harmony or, or equilibrium. If we can learn to understand how the planet works, we can begin to use our creativity in a more useful way. There's an awful lot going on outside. 
To begin, you've, you've possibly heard about the Gaia hypothesis by James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis. As we saw before, it's all of life and the interaction between all living and non-living systems that makes the planet fit for life. I'd like to give you some Buckminster examples. Buckminster Fuller said that you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing one obsolete. And I think this is very much the attitude we have to take. Well, my point here is, in order to move forward, we need to have a vision of where we're going. We need a plan. We need, we need some sort of an idea of where we're going. So here we are. There's our graph, and that's where we're going. That's where we are, actually. There's our present. High energy use, resource depletion, populations going up, pollutions, extinctions. It's all not looking very good. So where, where do we actually want to go from here? Well, these are... This is coming from the transition town. This is the model that they've developed by basically looking at the different areas that seem to be out there that people are attempting to, uh, ways that people are attempting to tackle the problems that we're facing. Techno fantasy, that's, that's um, feeding clouds. Green tech stability, that's the electric car. Total collapse. But here's what I, I would propose, a creative dissent and the recognition that we are actually Earth. So this becomes our aim, to try and delicately interweave some, some, some answers in there. This is our context. We need to be able to learn to design within our bioregion. The distance that you can walk in a day or ride your bike. You need to find your materials there. You need to work with the people within there. It's about localizing everything that we, we begin to do. A plant can do it. I mean, these two plants are absolutely identical. One just got more sunlight. And we can do the same thing. We need to reflect the resources and the, and the materials that we find in our local condition and, and use them appropriately. We can also find different ways of working together because I think that the, the current model of, of service to industry doesn't really work. We need to go away and create cooperative relationships or symbiotic relationships. You've probably seen a lot of the work that's done in social innovation by Ezio Manzini. This stuff is amazing. And that dryer is based on a belief system of working in an economy that is based on speed. I mean, that dryer comes out of a comes out of an, a, 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 a thinking that everything must go quickly. I don't have time to do anything. I'm supposed to be here tomorrow, and I've got to do that the next day, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be whipping around the earth. Um, the reality of it is, is all you really need is that little piece of string and some sunlight to do your clothes. So by changing the way we perceive the reality that we're in, these types of solutions can begin to present themselves. Rob Hopkins says that resilience refers to the ability of a system from individuals to whole economies to hold together and maintain their ability to function in the face of change and shocks from the outside. But what is, what is resilience? This is an image of a, a tensegrity structure by Buckminster Fuller. And it's probably the most perfect example of something which has absolutely no resilience whatsoever. If I cut any string or break any piece of that structure, it will completely collapse the entire structure. But yet, this is the way we think at the moment, because we're, we're locked into that system where we're, everything is based on money. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce our costs. We're trying to make things as, as, as absolutely simple as possible and, and take material out of it. But that's what we're also doing is we're building in obsolescence at the same time, because these things that we create have no resilience.